my name is Ken Tiger. I'm the Director of Technical Services with DA Penn Grade and Penn Grade 1 High Performance Oils. Um, I'm going to warn you now, I'm a very loud talker. I promise I'm not yelling at any of you, um, but uh, I do get uh, very passionate about what I do. I care very deeply about what I do, and I hope, uh, I hope that comes through. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm not doing my job. But I can't thank you enough for, for coming. Um, when you manufacture the best high performance, racing, classic, vintage, legacy, historic, muscle car and street rod engine oil in the market today, you consistently remain a target mainstay for the competition. They look to any and all advantage and can resort to some very devious measures like propagating false claim, utilization of familiar terminology and clever acronyms, and even carefully selected packaging, all in the hope of providing their product an edge. You can only imagine the apprehension instigated by the competition when the Brad Penn brand, the very brand most associate as the original green oil, was sold to and acquired by the DA Lubricant Company out of Lebanon, Indiana. And the months that followed, when the new ownership decided to rename the original green oil and redesign its packaging. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you this morning that the original green oil lives. Not only is it still alive, but it is thriving. And it has never been more popular than it is today. One thing to always keep in mind with Penn Grade 1 high performance oils, they've been around for 50 plus years over half a century for good reason. They are truly multi-generational. These are the oils your father used or your grandfather used. When I think of Penn Grade One, words like pride, passion, pedigree, legacy, heritage, Proven, and my favorite, protection, still used today that best describe Penn Grade 1. So within the next hour, sit back, relax, buckle up, and enjoy Penn Grade's presentation of selecting the appropriate lubricants for your application. Now it all started in 1967 when the original Kendall GT1 high performance oil first rolled out to the masses. Remember the gold can and the two fingers? Two fingers indicated the first 2,000 mile oil. Kendall kicked it up by making a high performance oil and making it green. Hence, the very first green oil. Made popular by the likes of Big Daddy Don Garlitz, Hall of Famer Bruce Larson, and the list goes on and on. Swore by the original green oil. And for many years it flew under the Brad Penn name. And how that all came about was simply in 1995, the owner of Kendall, the Wickle Corporation, decided to liquidate some of its lubricant businesses. Two of, the, two of their known brands, Kendall and Amelie, were sold to third parties. So that refinery in Bradford, Pennsylvania, the oldest continuously operated lube refinery in the entire world that only processes Pennsylvania grade crude, was eventually sold to American Refining Group. Now in 1998, they started up their own lubricants blending facilities, and in 2015, they eventually sold the brand their Finnish lubricants brand being Brad Penn to the DA Lubricant Company. 
Now, obviously, without that affiliation with Kendall, the brass at American Refining Group said, we'd like to start up our blended loops. And without that affiliation, they had to come up with a new branded name. The name that they chose was Brad Penn, which was simply short for Bradford, Pennsylvania. So when they pulled up stakes and left, joined the ConocoPhillips family, and started blending their own products, in 2001, the Brad Penn brand decided we'd like to get back into the high-performance racing classic car business, and the Brad Penn Penn Grade 1 high-performance oil was introduced. The green oil obviously became its nickname. Uh, the initial focus was obviously engine builders, high-performance, classic, vintage legacy car owners. Uh, all the trade shows were targeted and, and visited, uh, including PRI, SEMA, good guys events, etc. Obviously, uh, later on, we became much more involved with internet, uh, chat rooms, and the product was introduced as the Brad Penn, Penn Grade 1 High Performance Oil, the original green oil. <clears throat> what makes the Penn Grade 1 High Performance Oil <clears throat> so unique and so different from all the others in the market today is the incorporation of that very unique Pennsylvania grade base stock. The same base oil cut that was used in the original Kendall GT1 high performance oil. That is the one consistency throughout the entirety of this oil's existence. Now what's so unique about Penn grade 1 high performance oils? Well obviously it is free of asphaltic constituents and contains only trace amounts of natural contaminants like nitrogen and sulfur. The base oil also exhibits a very high VI or viscosity index. It's a very desirable characteristic of any given lubricant. The higher the viscosity index, the less the viscosity change over a given temperature range. It's the oil's ability to stay in grade. And again, it's a very desirable characteristic. Uh, characteristic. But my favorite characteristic with the Penn Grade 1 high performance oil is its natural metal wetting characteristic. Its affinity, if you will, to metal surfaces. It's a tenacious clingability that is unparalleled and has no equal in the market today. Because of all those unique characteristics, obviously, it's been the choice of manufacturers and end users for well over 100 years. Other companies that have used this base oil, going back old school, obviously Kendall, Pennzoil, Quaker State, Wolf's Head, all companies that blended with Pennsylvania grade crude. There is one high performance engine oil in the market today that still utilizes that unique Pennsylvania grade cut and that's Penn Grade 1. So again, new look, same product, proven performance. I can tell you how great Penn Grade 1 is until I'm blue in the face. I want you to use the product and see for yourself Half a century of proven performance speaks volumes. I once read that an application holds no prejudice against age or gender, only bad oil. Now while that was an attempted humor, it does have a certain ring of truth to it. Applications are unbiased and non-judgmental, except where that matters most, and that's performance. There's a lot of discussion today about additives. What's the big additive everybody's talking about today to protect their flat tappet and roller cams? Zinc. Zinc. And many of today's modern engine oils have seen a drastic reduction in the amount of anti-wear chemistry. The reason for that is very simple. Anti-wear 
chemistry, specifically zinc and phosphorus, or your ZDDP package, your zinc dialkyl phosphate, has been reduced to protect and extend the life of catalytic converters. How many race applications have catalytic converters? How many pre-1975 vehicles have catalytic converters? So why should you have to operate under a different agenda? Okay, That's why pen grade one is so heavily sought for racing classic vintage legacy street rod and muscle car applications. Not only do you get that tenacious clingability, that metal wetting characteristic, but you couple that with the enhanced levels of anti-wear. It's a phenomenal product. But getting back to additives, because this is such a hot topic today, I thought it would be nice to spend a few slides to really kind of give you the background of additive technology and why it's so important. Now, an additive is a material that is added to a specific base oil to, in order to change its physical properties or performance characteristics. A base oil is simply that, a base oil, until you add an additive. And it's only then that it becomes a lubricant. Okay? So obviously there are different types of additives. You have chemically inert addi additives that act to improve the performance characteristics of any given oil. On the left there you see some examples of what, what are considered chemically inert additives from emulsifiers, demulsifiers, foam inhibitors, most passenger car motor oil or even heavy duty diesel varieties have chemically inert additives. On the other side of the coin you have chemically active that react chemically to the metal surfaces that form protective films. Anti-wear, detergent, dispersant, as you can see on the list, EP, extreme pressure. Now this is where your formulation chemists earn their big bucks. You take all those chemistries, all those different additives and base oil, and you must have them work in a synergistic fashion. So in this particular slide you see the chemistry that is actually suspended in the oil versus those that are aggressively fighting for the surface, creating those protective films. And as you can see there, there are several that do that. Now when you look at a typical passenger car motor oil, on the right in the beaker you see the multitude of additives that are actually used and frankly needed. And all of those additives are generally used outside of wear protection to combat the byproducts of internal combustion the acids, the soot, the varnish, the moisture, all of those byproducts that you produce by simply running your engine. That's what those additives combat. So you take a base oil which comprises 70 to 85 percent of the actual lubricant and your additives which can be anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Some of the newer modern licensed PCMOs today can have as much as 30 percent or higher in additive technology. And obviously the treat rate of additives would drop significantly depending on the application. I typically refer to those as non-engine applications. Who can give me an example of a non-engine application? How about transmission or gear? Okay. Now obviously all those additives are needed in motor oils because again you're dealing with the byproduct of internal combustion. Most automotive applications are mobile and come within a wide range of environs that can have a negative or adverse effect on the performance of the oil. And obviously automo automotive applications uh, where I live in northern Pennsylvania, where it's Siberia for four months out of the year. If we didn't have a multi-grade engine oil, we'd never get our engine started. Whereas if you live in the warmer climates, southwest, southeast, where the ambient temperature is more conducive to driving, 
continuously throughout the year, the use of a monograde or straight weight or linear viscosity oil is often preferred just from the film strength and shear stability standpoint. Engine oils fail for three main reasons. Contamination, oil degradation, and additive depletion, which all lends to engine wear. Engine wear that can change the surface geometry of any given component and certainly shorten engine life. Now let's just say on average, uh, average fuel cell today in a passenger car, let's say 16 gallons. So every six fill-ups or every 100 gallons that you're putting into your gas tank, you're producing 90 to 120 gallons of water. Water that is uh, often is evacuated out the tailpipe. You're producing three to 10 gallons of unburnt fuel a half to two pounds of soot and carbon, a quarter to a pound of varnish, and certainly one to four pounds of sulfuric and nitric acid. Again, this is why you change your oil, ladies and gentlemen, and why you should never extend an oil drain just for the sake of doing so. Now, the older cars, it was always tough, and that's why the 3,000 mile recommended change was the one size fits all. But many of us drive modern vehicles. And what do we have on our dash that lets us know it's time to change the oil? Exactly. And that's just measuring the oxidative state of that oil at any given time. Okay? How many of you run full synthetics in your everyday car? How many of you run your drain intervals out to 5,000 miles? How many of you run them out to 7,500? Good. <clears throat> I'm old school, so I often recommend for a conventional mineral-based product, still change your oil every 3,000 miles. A synthetic blend, which technically could contain 1 to 99% synthetic component, but generally it's around 30-35%. Uh, I recommend 3 to 5,000 mile drains. Um, and then certainly with full synthetics between five and 7,500 miles. Drain interval is always tough because it really is dependent on many factors, how and when you use the application. But again, those are guidelines I typically operate by. So because I travel so much with my job, um, I certainly run a full synthetic in my vehicle, in my wife's vehicle, and I typically try to change the oil around 5,000 miles. So obviously, any qualified engine lubricant will certainly lubricate and protect components, but certainly keep them cool and keep components clean. One that is often mentioned uh, is uh, how engine oils work as a seal, but I just didn't add it on the list. But again, engine oils are asked to do a lot of things. One area that I really try to focus on is maintenance. And what I have up on the screen is 100 years of automotive and aviative, aviative history. I think we would all agree that as, application as applications have changed, so has the lubricants. And Great example up on the top is the 1908 Model T Ford that ran nothing more than an API SA quality straight base oil, generally the same viscosity as an SA30. Whereas in the 1940s when they introduced zinc anti-wear, and in the 1950s when they developed the chemistry to create what is known as multi-grade engine oils. By the way, does anybody know what the W stands for in a 5W20 or a 10W30? Correct. A lot of people say weight. It has nothing to do with weight. It means winter. And it identifies that oil as being best suited 
for cold ambient temperature startup conditions. Anyways, I digress. To today's supercars, very tight clearances, high horsepower, highly stressed engines. You have street legal engines today, seven, eight, nine hundred horsepower, and that's only climbing. Now let me put that into some perspective for you. The 1908 Model T Ford was capable of producing an astounding 20 horsepower. That's the same horsepower equivalency of many of today's riding lawnmowers. 100 years later, we have vehicles, engines specifically, that are capable, capable of producing 8, 900 horsepower, requiring very light synthetic oils, um, and we're relying on that for protection. Take the aviative industry and the Wright brothers that likely used a tallow infused, probably whale fat, to lubricate their simple chain drives on their gliders. To the 1950s era and the Piper Cubs that ran a straight 50 weight engine oil. To today's jetliner industry. Now that one in particular is of great interest to me. Now think about it. You're in a pressurized cigar tube. You're flying 500 miles an hour at 37,000 feet where the outside ambient temperature is minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's neither the time nor the place to have a lubricant related failure. So rather than be reactive to a situation, Follow the three P's of maintenance. Be proactive, be preventative, and be predictive. By the way, can anybody tell me what the acceptable failure rate in the airline industry is today? It's zero, okay? Zero. They, they practice what's known as a vision alignment, just like most racing teams do. They all have to be on the same page. Everybody has the same job. But by the end of the day, when it's all said and done, it's all about performance and safety, okay? So literally, the days of just use any oil or just because it's slippery are long over. My point is this, oil is the lifeblood of any application. And there really is no bigger maintenance item more important to extending an application's life let alone reducing its repair costs. Oil is often considered the cheapest component of any application. But when you take a step back and look at the overall picture, you'll find very quickly that is its most critical. Okay? If an end user expects their engines to endure and maintain performance, it's not, it's never a good idea to sacrifice values just to save a few bucks, okay? I'm often asked two questions when it comes to pen grade one high performance oil. What viscosity should I run and how often should I change my oil? Now let's talk about the latter for a second. Racing. Racing and racers, in general, tend to want to change your oil after every weekend or every couple of uh, weekends because they're just putting that oil, that lubricant, under very high stress, very loaded conditions. And I would tend to agree. There's only one surefire way to determine oil viability or its usage, and that's through oil analysis. Because oil analysis not only gives you a nice snapshot of the health of the oil, but of the engine uh, health as well, okay? So you have that side of the spectrum and you have classic car owners that maybe only use their application three or four months out of the year before it gets stored. And a lot of racers do the same thing. They'll run their engines and at the end of the season, they'll pull out the engines and leave them sit for several weeks to months at a time, which we call static uh, inactivity. 
Now, for those classic vintage legacy, vintage car owners, what I typically recommend with the Penn Grade 1 high performance oils is change the oil every 3,000 miles or once a year, whichever comes first. Now, why once a year? Again, some end users only use their vehicles for a couple hundred miles a year or maybe a couple thousand miles a year. And I'll have people say, you know, Ken, I change my oil religiously every 3,000 miles. But when I push them on the subject, they eventually fess up and say, yeah, you know, it might take me three or four years to hit that number. So all that suggests to me is that every winter or prior to that long, lengthy storage static period, they store the engine with used oil sitting in the crankcase. All the acid, soot, varnish, moisture, it's not good for the overall maintenance of the engine by leaving those harmful byproducts sitting in the application. So what we recommend is prior to any anticipated storage period that you change the oil and filter then. Run the engine for, you for a few minutes, make sure it gets up to operating temperature, get it well circulated, shut it down, and leave it be. Okay? Now in relationship to viscosity selection, I generally factor in three criteria. Main and rod bearing clearance is obviously critical. The anticipated ambient temperature operation, is it run primarily in the summer, winter, or year round? And then last but not least, whatever the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, and or your engine builder recommend. And all the folks universally at Penn Grade 1 are unanimous in our thinking. When an engine builder speaks, we listen. They know your equipment better than anybody. You know your equipment better than anybody. But when an engine builder says, I want a 60 weight or 70 weight engine oil in that blown alcohol engine, that's what you need to run. Okay. So again, that's just some of the typical storage practices of racing applications, classic cars. Um, so uh, moving on, you run into some significant issues when you don't run the right viscosity or weight of your engine oil. If you run too light a viscosity, it could lend to an internal and external leakage issue uh, you can have loss of system pressure. You can have loss of system precision control. And it could certainly lend itself to increased wear. Now, on the flip side of that coin, running too heavy a viscosity for your application could lend to increased internal friction, which would certainly cause an increase in operating temperature. It would eventually increase your power consumption and ultimately lead to sluggish operation. How many racers? like to hear sluggish operation. Exactly. Viscosity selection and drain interval are very important. This topic sticks in my craw because uh, 10, 20 calls I might get a day are about aftermarket additives. Now I know there's a lot of information out on the internet and the internet is a wonderful tool for education and learning. But on the flip side of that coin, it can be very detrimental. There's a lot of bad advice out there. You're reading somebody else's opinion. And I'll often say, if you're afraid of getting the bad apple, then stay the hell out of the orchard. Come to shows like SEMA. Come to shows like PRI. Speak to those that manufacture the components or the lubricants and hear it directly from them. Why is this such a bothersome topic for me? Because I know there are many people today that have done their homework. And they have realized that the modern oils today have seen that drastic reduction in anti-wear chemistry. And because so, they seek out additives 
that they eventually add to the blended finished lubricant. We already talked about how motor oils are a precise balance of components in base oil and how important it is to have that synergistic characteristic. All those components must work together for the desired uh, performance characteristics. When you add an aftermarket additive to an already blended, already formulated lubricant, not only do you risk disrupting that perfect formulation balance, but now you've literally just changed the identity of the oil. Furthermore, in a lot of cases that I've seen, adding extra zinc additive can actually disassociate and create more harmful acids that are just left sitting in your crankcase. If you have to rely on an aftermarket additive to change some aspect of your oil's performance, guess what? You're using the wrong oil. Pen grade one high performance oil, aside from the unique characteristics of its base oil cut, affords you enhanced levels of zinc phosphate chemistry. Everything is self-contained. You don't have to add a thing. So as, again, pen grade one high performance, enhanced ZDDP package. The typical zinc content in pen grade one is around 1,500 parts per million. Uh, the typical phosphorus content, or the back end of that ZDD package, is around 1,400 parts per million. In comparison to a modern day licensed API SN Plus or ILSAC GF5 resource conserving oil that many of us run in our modern vehicles today, 800 parts per million of zinc, 760 ish of phosphorus. It's almost cut in half. Multiple detergent system. We actually incorporate calcium, magnesium, sodium. It's a three-headed monster. And I refer to that term lightly because it does such a wonderful job. There's just no better way to describe it, of keeping components clean and cool. And certainly the ZD, ZDDP, or the enhanced levels of anywhere, uh, does its job with protection. It's the unique cut. Pennsylvania grade metal wetting characteristics we've all, all discussed because ultimately you're protecting not only your flat tappet and or roller cams. Roller cams in particular, we're seeing a lot of premature wear in the needle bearings because they're using modern engine oils with the redu uh, reduced anti-wear chemistry. So you have your flat tappet and roller cam and when by the way, you're known as the flat tap at roller cam oil throughout the industry. That speaks volumes. There's your roller cams. And again, a lot of, a lot of premature wear now that's being reported because, well, there's just not enough anywhere protection. <clears throat> Real quick, the high temp, high shear rate of an oil is often one that I look at. High temperature, high shear is all about viscosity retention, and film strength. The higher the high temp, high shear of any given lubricant really kind of denotes the oil's ability to protect bearings under highly stressed, highly loaded conditions. The higher the high temp, high shear, the better. R20W50 has one of the high, highest high temp, high shear rates in the industry, if not the highest. Uh, all that information is readily available on our product data sheets. And I would certainly encourage any of you to stop by our booth for that information if you so desire. Because this is what you're protecting. Highly stressed, highly loaded, high RPM applications that deserve and demand the very best. So again, in 2015, when we were acquired and the new ownership decided to rename the product and redesign its packaging, all of our loyal customers went into a panic. What happened to my green oil? I want my green oil back. Where is Brad Penn? It never left, ladies and gentlemen. It was simply renamed. 
So to combat a lot of that negativity, we actually put the Penn Grade 1 high performance oil through the most comprehensive wear evaluation ever performed in the 50 plus years of its existence. We actually went to dealers of Brad Penn, now Penn Grade 1, and selectively uh, uh, pulled two quarts of Brad Penn oil, still said Brad Penn on the shelf, and two quarts of Penn Grade 1 and sent them in for evaluation at a nationally recognized anal uh, analysis facility. The goals were simple. We wanted to verify that the samples were one and the same, because a lot of folks said Brad Penn is not the same as Penn Grade 1 and vice versa. We wanted to be as truthful and as transparent as possible with all of the analysis and to prove once and for all that today's Penn Grade 1 high performance oil was in fact the original green oil. Subsequently, the results, as they say, were expected. Not only did it pass with flying colors, but it allowed us to reassure our loyal customers who really expect nothing less from their oil. Let me emphasize, as long as our Penn Grade 1 high performance oil possesses that unique Pennsylvania grade cut, it will always be considered that heritage, that legacy, that pedigree that is Brad Penn and before that, Kendall GT1. So again, uniquely formulated for the older classic vintage legacy vehicles, those that still incorporate flat tappet cam or even modern applications, where the flat tappet cam introduces to a more pronounced boundary regime or metal to metal contact. Higher valve spring pressure, higher RPM, that screen for more anti wear. And then the issues with the roller cams. Always the original green oil. And here are just some of the applications that Penn Grade 1 is synonymous with wear protection, where Penn Grade 1 is often used. And these are some of my favorite shots. Now down on the bottom there, marine engines, where there's been significant issue with engine protection. Now think about it. Marine engines are under 100% load almost 90% of the time. You're either stopped or you're at full throttle. And that's because the boat is working so hard against the resistance of the water. Okay? Where in comparison, a modern passenger car motor oil is under 100% load maybe 10% of the time. So that simply means marine engines are under far more stress and are far more susceptible to wear. So do you think it's appealing for an off-boat racer to run a modern-day oil that has seen a drastic reduction in anti-wear chemistry or to run an oil that is synonymous with protection? Of course, they choose the latter. And in many cases and instances, it's the preferred oil for many marine applications. Again, this is just a small listing of applications that Penn Grade 1 simply shines in. I run Penn Grade 1 in all of my lawn equipment back home four-wheelers, lawn tractors. I do not run them in my modern car. <laughs> as much as I'd like to, it still possesses a catalytic converter, an O2 sensor. As long as you're not burning oil, and that's, I've had many people say, you know, can the hell with the catalytic converter. I'd much rather protect my valve train componentry. 
the lifters, wrist pins, main and rod bearings, flat and or roller cams, and the pen grade one being synonymous with that, I'd rather roll the dice and take my chances. I can't sit up here this morning and tell you to run the pen grade one high performance oil in a modern vehicle because I know that if you're burning any oil and if you're getting any of that back into the CAD, it could become detrimental. Now keep in mind, it's not the high levels of zinc that can become detrimental, it's actually the phosphorus. So we'll get into that later, but I just wanted to share that with you. In my opinion, it's all about engine protection, okay? So this summer in particular, um, I was in five different states in a seven week time frame. And these are the shows that we do. Penn Grade One is a very popular visit and be because number one, people are still learning that it is still available. Number two, they have questions about its anti-wear, why is it green, you name it, it goes on and on. Um, it's, it's so gratifying in my position to be able to hand over a case of pen grade one to an end user that very much appreciates the performance and the availability of the product. Real quick, let's talk about air-cooled engines. Many of you know air-cooled engines place an extraordinary demand upon an, uh, an engine oil. Air-cooled engines lack a radiator, and they must rely on the ambient air to cool the engine. Now that's a very difficult thing to do when the outside ambient temperature is 80, 90, 100 degrees. Air-cooled engines create hot spots that the longer the oil is exposed to, can lead to a more pronounced oxidative state and certainly varnish conditions. Running a conventional mineral-based oil like Pen Grade 1 in an air-cooled application is certainly recommended, but under the operation of a more frequent, carefully selected interval. And that is a sacrifice any air-cooled engine owner is willing to make given the protection of pen grade one. Plus think about when many of these air-cooled engines were manufactured. Be, uh, Porsche, Volkswagen, Corvair engines that are notorious for running well above 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And end users still comment to us that we still uh, are able to enjoy 3,000 mile oil drains. Film strength, shear stability, thermal stability, pen grade one checks all the boxes. Synthetic oils. Many of you know several of our competitors offer synthetic lubricants, full synthetics. Pen grade one offers a line of partial synthetic high performance oils as well as 100% conventional mineral based. All of the Pen Grade 1 conventional products are 100% mineral based, whereas the multi-grades are considered partial synthetics. And that simply means that around 12 years ago, when it was still known under the Brad Pen name, the brass decided that they wanted to give the end users the best of both worlds. So they incorporated, they, they did so by incorporating a very small percentage of, of PAO or polyalpha olefin synthetic component, actually less than 10% into the formulation. But it was never done at the expense of the remaining film strength and shear stability of Pen Grade 1, of, of the uh, unique Pennsylvania grade base oil cut. Some advantages of running full synthetic oils, better high temperature stability, better low temperature fluidity or pumpability when it's cold or cold start scenario, and obviously better volatility. Synthetic oils do do a much better job at offering uh, extended drain. Some of the downfalls of running a synthetic oil is cost. Uh, synthetic oils can be three to four times as much as in compared to a conventional mineral-based product. 
Synthetic oils are very light and libristic in their very nature. Um, if you are burning oil or if you have an external leakage issue, it can actually exacerbate, make those issues worse just due to its light nature. But my biggest knock against synthetic oils is how they lack the clingability of a good quality conventional mineral based oil, something that pen grade one is synonymous with. When you lack clingability, the oil fails to stay put. And when you don't have oil on any given surface of that component, you're into more of what's known as boundary regime or metal to metal contact, all lending to increased wear, in many cases uh, premature or even catastrophic. Think of a mineral-based oil and furthering the refining process where you're taking the refined oil, throwing it in another catalyst, turning up the heat, turning up the pressure, and cracking the ununiform molecules down to a more uniform size. And you do that for more planned, predictable results. That's how you create a synthetic base oil. Some of the more popular base oils today, polyalpha olefins, like I've just discussed, diesters, polyolesters, PAGs. Again, better oxidation stability because they offer better volatility, longer drains. But ladies and gentlemen, how many racers do you know that value extended drains over the ultimate protection of their engine? I hope you don't know anybody like that. Real quick on government involvement. Remember, everything is fuel economy and emissions driven today. My personal vehicle is a Chevy Silverado crew cab. Guess what weight viscosity is required for my V8 engine? Zero W20. Have any of you ever poured a zero W20? It's almost like water, okay? So when I'm driving my engine, and I know I'm afforded that quick pumpability and flowability on initial start. But when I shut down that big motor, and with that lack of clingability, where do you think all that oil's going? Whew. Right down here to the pan. Okay? One of the unique characteristics of Pen Grade 1, especially in those older classic vehicles, or even your engines that you pull out of your racing rig at the end of the season. Once that oil hits that metal surface, it clings and stays put. So when you go out, you get everything buttoned up, or you go out and start your stored application for the very first time, where almost 70% of engine wear occurs, you're always protected from what's known as that dry start scenario. Synthetic oils don't give you that. They don't afford you that. But I really want to uh, specifically discuss the zinc and phosphorus percentages and ethanol use in relationship to fuel. Now again, we've already talked about this. Catalytic converters do one thing very well. They convert harmful emissions like nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide into less harmful emissions, nitrogen and carbon dioxide. They contain very sensitive catalyst material, oftentimes platinum, polonium, radium that if any of that phosphorus gets back into that catalytic converter, can actually volatize and poison the sensitive catalyst within that catalytic converter, rendering them useless. That's why to this day, we typically take the high road and don't recommend pen grade one in any system that possesses a catalytic converter or O2 sensor. Now, once the catalytic converter is off or an erasing application, the gloves are off, as they say, and when you should really consider the use of beefing up that anti-wear package to protect valve train components. You know, it's funny, the newer oils today are all designed to be back applicable for even the older legacy classic applications. But that doesn't necessarily translate into the right oil for the needs of said applications. Now, even going back to the older classic engines, you got to remember that the bearing clearances in those older legacy cars were designed for the viscosity grades available 
when those vehicles were first manufactured, the engines in general. That's why everybody back in the day ran a straight 30 weight oil. And there were just a handful of multi-grade oils available. But why are 1030, 1040, 1540, and 2050 are so popular, 2050 in particular, amongst the classic racing community? So, again, catalytic converters. By the way, if anybody has a high wheelbase vehicle, one of the major thefts today taking place is people climbing underneath your car and hacksawing off the catalytic converter. Because of that precious metal inside, they're taking it down to a less than scrupulous junkyard, getting a couple bucks for it. I certainly don't, I'm not trying to encourage any of you to start doing that. Please don't, but just something to keep aware of. Um, and again, this, as applications change, just real quickly, more of the, those vehicles without catalytic converters or high performance racings, particularly crate engines, where you don't have to worry about uh, the sensitive emission systems, but rather where. And the chemistry of pen grade one kind of puts you in that category, the old obsolete API service category, SC, SD, uh, the 1200 parts per million, where we have taken that foundation and beefed it up even higher. Like I said before, 1500. But you can see in the yellow boxes where how the phosphorus levels have seen that de uh, steady decline from 1,200 parts per million to the SJ oils at 1,000, and it just keeps continuously going south. Again, all based on better fuel economy and better emissions. The fuel economy for the lighter, lighter viscosity oils but better emissions has been uh, the, uh, the reduction of anti-war. And again, real quick, the Penn Grade 1 high performance oils, as you can see in the red, are typically recommended clear up to the class of car owners that have the pre-1975 vehicles, whereas our Penn Grade line, our licensed oil division, really kind of grabs the torch and runs clear up to today's modern cars, okay? So there is a big difference. Different animals. A lot of you have seen the API service symbol. Uh, I encourage you, the next time you're at a big box store, to walk down the lubricants aisle, pull a quart of oil off the shelf, and read what's on the back. There's a lot of good information back there, at least with the, 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 the qualified oils. This is the, wor the standard worldwide way to identify the viscosity of a gasoline or diesel engine oil. That little donut, that API service symbol, has a lot of information contained. For instance, it gives you the API service category. It defines the viscosity of the oil at cold temperature, as well as the viscosity of that oil under operating temperature, which is typically measured at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. What's amazing today is API has already adopted a 0W16 engine oil, and you have companies overseas that are already field evaluating 0W8. Unbelievable, okay? Now, real quick, anybody use E85 fuel? Okay, when it first came out, we kind of took the high road. We really didn't know a lot about this new fuel source. We know that many end users, customers were using it. Um, so we took the high road and, and, and really said, you know, the newer oils today have all been designed to run in conjunction with the 85 fuel. We'll talk about that in just a second. But we just figured that they wouldn't work very well with the older chemistry Pen grade one high performance oil. Boy, were we, were we wrong, okay? The newer oils were all designed with better rust protection and emulsion retention. Phase separation was also critical because E85 fuel is hygroscopic in nature, which means it has a very nasty habit of collecting and holding moisture. 
Now, is that a problem with somebody that's changing your oil on a more frequent, carefully uh, interval? Of course not. But what do you think happens when you don't bother changing your oil and storing your engine or application for long idle static periods? That hydroscopic nature, the resultant can be gel, foam, it's just a nightmare. So we always recommend, use the 85. It's a, it's a wonderful fuel source. It's proven itself for well over a decade, almost two decades to be exact. But don't leave used oil sitting in your crankcase ever, especially if you're running E85 fuel. Now for those of you that are interested, because I get asked this often, there's a website, pure, puregas.org, that if you ever wanted to run a non-ethanol fuel, puregas.org would literally give you all the ethanol-free fueling stations within your geographical location. Okay? Puregas.org. Simply put in your zip code and all the businesses will pop up. A fallback after everyone has done their research and have read about the drastic reduction in anti-work chemistry, they resort to diesel oil. <clears throat> Although modern diesel oils have succumbed to the emission standards and have reduced the levels of anti-wear, they still afford around 1,200 parts per million of zinc. But the one thing to consider about diesel oil is that it is a much different animal than a PCMO formulation. Yes, they share the same anatomy or makeup, but diesel oils contain more additives per volume than any typical passenger car motor oil. And, and to be completely honest, gasoline spark ignited or service related engines have much different needs than a compression or commercial grade engine. So if it's a diesel engine, ladies and gentlemen, use a diesel oil. Use a lubricant that was designed for the needs of said equipment. If it's gasoline powered, use a passenger car themed oil, pen grade one, okay? Will a diesel engine work, diesel engine oil work in a gasoline spark ignited engine? Of course it will, but is it the right oil? They're not using it because it's a diesel oil, they're using it because it still has higher levels of anti-wear. So, pen grade one high performance oils are available in five multi-grade, six mono-grade, 30 weight, 40 weight, 50 weight, 60 weight, and the Nitro 70. We also manufacture a phenomenal break in oil. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Our assembly lubricant, which is very popular, uh, contains no solid fillers like molybdenum disulfide, uh, Teflon, uh, graphite. Uh, it's very miscible with our break-in oil. Um, the diesel guys love it because they can literally climb underneath and work on the equipment and not have all that lubricant drip on them like most assembly lubes do. To finish up, just to get into the actual pen grade one line, of course, we manufacture the classic GL4. There's a very big difference in the amount of chemistry when you consider a GL4 versus a GL5. GL5, as you know, is the most recognized gear lubricant uh, today. 8090, 85, 140, etc. We still manufacture an 8090 GL4 because there's a lot of classic applications. How many of you remember the old Muncie Rock Crusher, the M22s? Full of yellow metal. And if you use an 8090 GL5, that sulfur, phosphorus, or EP chemistry in that GL5 will literally eat away, deteriorate, and degrade that softer yellow metal. A GL4 is essentially a half treat rate of a GL5 chemistry laden product, which makes it safe to use with yellow metallurgy. Yellow metallurgy, that's typically in your synchros, bushings, thrust washers, etc. We actually developed the classic GL4 after many individuals would call and say, I need something for my rear end or my transmission. 
that is known to possess yellow metallurgy. We still have it. And by the way, that is conventional mineral based. There's no synthetic component. We also offer a limited slip, GL5. Now we're back up to the GL5 chemistry, but there were many applications, as you know, the older 60s era Corvettes that were notorious for every sharp turn you made left, you'd hear that clunking noise. And that's because that particular system required that lubristic characteristic. And they're just some of the systems, the positive traction, traction lock, safety track, et cetera. Now our braking oil. The old school guys typically used a non-detergent 30 weight to break in their engines. And why is that? Well, without any detergency, when you're trying to seat steel cast iron rings, you would have a lot of varnish buildup by running the engine. It was actually that varnish that could help facilitate ring seating. Where today's more flexible chromoly rings, and I would be the first to tell you that they can seat very quickly, not only is it good to have anti-wear, but also detergency. So depending on the type of metallurgy that you're dealing with, that is why many old school guys today still prefer a non-detergent oil, when in all actuality, the break in oil with anti-wear and detergency would be the ticket. Break in oil is designed and tailored specifically for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to help facilitate ring seating. That is the whole premise of engine break-in. We're often asked how long should I run your break in oil. We typically recommend 30 minutes on the dyno or anywhere between 150 to 200 road driven miles, whichever your preferred break in method is. Um, so uh, any questions on break in oil real quick? I know that's a, that's a big product. So. Um, it's always amazing to me that if you get 10 engine builders in a room, you'll get 10 different ways on how to do something. I guarantee it. It is a science, okay? And our hats are always tipped off to those that can literally look at an engine, re, uh, tear it apart and rebuild it and have it functional. I'm the type of guy where if I take something apart, I usually end up with more parts than I started with, so I don't bother. So um, it's a phenomenal product. Uh, a lot of times I'm asked how much zinc is in your break-in oil. Uh, I often say it's controlled levels. Now in comparison to the pen grade one, the, the pen grade one break-in oil possesses a typical 1,000 parts per million of zinc versus the pen grade one running oil, which is at 1,500. Now some of you may be asking yourself why. Any good qualified engine builder will tell you that they expect some wear to occur during that initial run-in phase. And it's that supportive wear that can actually help facilitate ring seating. It's basically the same reason why you would never consider a synthetic oil or one possessing a synthetic component as a quote unquote break in oil. Because it creates that light labristic characteristic, you'll never get those rings seated properly. So any engine builder that comes to you and says, I use a, you know, full synthetic, high zinc, high phos oil, you'll never get those rings seated, okay? As far as storage of packaged goods like a case of oil, I typically recommend every three years, uh, uh, a typical shelf life of three years. Uh, I've known packaged goods to be viable uh, up to 10 years, but I certainly wouldn't recommend its use. And the typical three year shelf life is really based on how you store the lubricants. If it's elevated off the floor, away from any excess heat, moisture, light, things that are known to accelerate the oxidative process, it will have a drastic effect upon the oil. Uh, um, the best scenario. Those that are stored in a non-climate controlled environment, exposed to the ambient temperatures, Exposed to excess light, heat, moisture, very poor scenario, okay? Typical three-year shelf life is what I would ask you all to adhere to. Now, 
Let me leave you with, with one last thought. My youngest sister is a school teacher. And in her classroom hangs the inspirational poster titled 212, The Extra Degree. Have any of you seen this? Well, for those of you that haven't, it simply reads that at 211 degrees, water's hot. At 212 degrees, water boils. And with boiling water comes steam. And with steam, you can power a train. And the simple message is how one extra degree makes all the difference. Pen grade one, high performance oil, the original green oil, gives you that extra degree and will continue to do so for years to come. No one has ever regretted utilizing pen grade one in the 20 years that I've worked with the line. If there was any regret at all ever shared with me, it's that they didn't use the product sooner. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your PRI. Thank you very much.